Welcome to the Jazz Notes podcast. Ben Anderson, Chandler Holtz. Uh, it is January 9th. Happy New Year. We did record one last week, but uh, Jazz fans should be even happier now than they were a week ago, and they were playing well a week ago. As always, we will uh, look at the last week for the Utah Jazz. Look forward to the week ahead. We will address your uh, mailbag questions, hand out our, jan- our jazz grades, etc. So uh, a fun podcast ahead because Chandler, the Jazz have been playing extremely well. You can find us on Twitter at Ben's Hoops. Find Chandler, Chandler Holt KSL, and of course, read us at kslsports.com. Follow us on social media, TikTok, Twitter, X, Facebook, Instagram, threads, at KSL Sports. So we appreciate you doing that. All right, uh, Jazz, 3-1 and one in the last week, Chandler. We had said best case scenario, 2-2, two and two, and I thought that was pretty optimistic they'd go 2-2. Two and two. But uh, tough game against Detroit, who, by the way, is honestly just playing better. Yes. Now, I know Cade got hurt, so that's going to hurt them going forward. But they almost beat... Golden State, I think, in Golden State right after uh, almost beating the Jazz in Salt Lake City. So they are starting to play a lot harder. It seems like Monty Williams is getting that team to buy in a little bit more. But the Jazz beat Detroit. Unwatchable game on Friday night against the Boston Celtics. Like The Jazz just did not care, which is weird. Just They just didn't know show at all. Second night of a back-to-back, they go to Philly and win, which I was surprised just because of the circumstance. And I understand they didn't have Joel Embiid, but it was still the second night of a back-to-back after Philly had lost in New York the night before, and I'm like, that team's going to be hungry. They're going to come in and, and whoop the Jazz, uh, and they didn't. The Jazz were in control most of that game. They were up double digits over the last 11 minutes and never never got close. And then last night's win over Milwaukee, I don't think there's any question it's the best win of the season and the best performance of the Jazz so far this year. Yeah, definitely. Uh, like you said, we were hoping for like a 2-2 two and two week, and then it, it honestly started off kind of rocky. The Jazz went down by double digits to Detroit in the first half, and we're like, okay, are we going to be... Uh, one of the teams to lose to Detroit this year, but then it goes into OT, ends up being a great game. Bojan has probably his game of the season. Yeah. It's Alec what, Burks by far. Yes. Um, and then Clarkson puts up 36. Markinen puts up 31. Um, one of the big takeaways from this game for me is Utah lost the rebound battle, which is rare in, in Jazz wins, uh, but they won the turnovers, 17-12. Uh, to 12, um, And they also shot above 50% from the floor three and 90% from the free throw line. So that's just how you win games. If you look at a lot of the Jazz losses this year, it's because they're shooting like sub 40% from the floor. Right. But they shot great against the Pistons. Then, yeah, like you said, Boston, terrible loss. First game in a while, they weren't able to hit the 100-point mark. Um, And then Philadelphia and Milwaukee, both great wins. Don't want to take anything away. Joel Embiid wasn't playing, and uh, Lillard wasn't playing. But either way, two great back-to-back wins. No, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, a month ago, this is a game the Jazz would have lost. In Philly, no question the Jazz would have gone into that game and just stunk it up and not played well and not believed in themselves, uh, and and they bounce back and win it. And then there's also this mindset of hey we've done our job we got a game on this road trip which we were not expected to do let's pack it in milwaukee's the second best team in the east i think fourth best record overall in the nba just get back home and prepare for denver and just don't worry about this game take the night off and they didn't i mean they came out and were just throwing haymakers 11 first quarter threes and then more importantly than shots made their defense was awesome well, their defense was so good in the first half. Giannis didn't get going. I know he finished with a triple-double, but he did not have it in the first half. Brooke Lopez was a non-factor in the first half on the offensive side. Chris Middleton, I don't remember hearing his name hardly at all in that game. So Jazz defensive scheme and then just effort was really high. But I thought the three-man wall that Will Hardy was throwing at Giannis all night was just like awesome. And I've seen you know Quinn Snyder try some interesting things with Giannis, including saying, well, Rudy Gobert is going to guard Giannis, and you're just going to put Rudy Gobert right under the basket. And Giannis can't do his little push-off thing with the ball that he does and then spin and get to the rim because Rudy's just going to be waiting there for him. Or if he wants to take 10 threes in this game, he can. And if he he beats you that way, you tip your cap to him. I've seen the Jazz defend Giannis in some interesting ways. None have been as effective as what we saw last night from Will Hardy because Will Hardy is a good coach. I think Will Hardy, I am very firmly on the, that's a good basketball coach I'm watching bandwagon. Uh, And I know where there were some questions earlier this year and we had some mailbag questions like, is Will Hardy getting these guys prepared It's like he's trying a lot of things. He tinkers a lot. And when you tinker that much, you're going to have things that don't work. But the nice thing about Will Hardy is he's not married to any of his ideas. If they don't work, he throws them out. Even if there's something he, like, really, truly believes in. Like, this is one of my ethics as a basketball coach. This is a this is a what a lot of coaches would say is, like, non-negotiable. If it doesn't work, Will Hardy is not married to the idea. He's not in love with his own genius. And I think that's a that's kind of a rare thing to see in coaches it, it it bodes well for his future 
Um, I agree with you that the Milwaukee Bucks win was one of the best of the season. Uh, but I want to go back to the 76ers win because I think that is also up there for a specific reason. The Jazz had 23 turnovers in that game to Philadelphia's six, yeah. right? Uh, but the points off turnovers was 24 to 13. So basically the Jazz scored off of all their turnovers. Right. And they only allowed Philadelphia to score on about half of those, which is something you did not see from the Jazz in the first two months of the season. Like if, if they were turning the ball over, they were most likely getting scored on. Uh, but they were able to hold strong, and that's probably one of the biggest reasons they were able to win despite having so many turnovers. Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with transition defense where the Jazz were abysmal last year and really bad to start the season. But it it, it surprised me when I looked up these numbers because I wrote up an article yesterday on like what's changed for the Jazz and why are they winning all these games. You can find that at kslsports.com. Uh, in fact, we'll probably throw it in the newsletter. If you don't subscribe to the Utah Jazz newsletter, you can. You can see it in all of my articles uh, I tweet it out every once in a while and go to kslsports.com uh, and, and subscribe to the Jazz Newsletter, which comes out every Tuesday and gives you some early and unique access to coverage that we have. But over the last 15 games, I would have thought because, you know, you had the big 136-point outing last night. What did they put up against Dallas a couple of—or or just at the—on on New Year's Day, it was 135 points. You know, they had scored 154 against da- uh, Detroit. You would think, like, this Jazz team is— scoring a ton of points and the offense is going to be through the roof it's not how the jazz are winning games right now the jazz actually over their last 15 games i think are the 11th best defensive team in the nba and like 16th best offensively so they're considerably better on the defensive side of the ball and then in the last 10 games when the jazz are eight and two you can look at it and the jazz are the sixth best defensive team in the nba and the 11th best offensive team. So the Jazz are locking in on the defensive side of the ball. Part of it's the zone. A ton of it has to do with Walker Kessler and what he's done off the bench. He's been awesome lately. He's not scoring like he did his uh, his rookie season, but but defensively he's really been dominant again. So good signs for the Utah Jazz, and that's the reason they're winning these games. All right, I want to talk about a few standing things, then we can go ahead and take a break. Um, right now the Jazz uh, are a half game back from the 10th seeded L.A. Lakers, who are 3-7 and seven in their last 10. Um, and the Jazz are four games from the 13th seeded Memphis. Speaking of which, John Moran just had a season-ending uh, shoulder injury. Uh, so they're done. They're done. They're done. Yeah, they're, 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 it's going to be really tough for them to find their way into the postseason. But also, not only are they a half game back from the 10th seed, they're only one and a half games back from the eighth seeded Phoenix Suns. Also, the Houston Rockets are five and five in their last 10. Yep. Three and 11 road record, which is worse than the Jazz now. Yep. Jazz could easily jump them to get into the postseason picture. Yeah, there's a there's a real pathway for the Jazz to make the playoffs. There, there's absolutely a real pathway, and you know I'll be curious if Golden State figures it out now that Draymond Green is back. But maybe they just can't figure it out because Clay's washed and Draymond's not going to keep his head on straight, and their role players are not very good. That could be a major issue. Houston, I have a huge questions of Mark uh, questions about Phoenix's a borderline disaster compared to expectations. Uh, I think they're better than the Jazz just because you have Kevin Durant and Devin Booker. You're going to win a lot of games. But, I mean, these got trounced by 30 last night. It was like a close game going into the fourth quarter, and they just fall apart because they're a dreadful fourth quarter team. So there are some teams that the Jazz could uh, could overtake. I think the Lakers will figure it out by the second half of the yep. season because that's what they always do. But uh, there is certainly some, some teams in front of the Jazz that uh, if they don't play well, the Jazz will be able to catch and overtake them like they did with the Golden State Warriors last night. Uh, yeah, let's take a quick break. We can look at the week ahead, some jazz news, do our grades, and uh, we'll answer your mailbag questions. Stick around. More jazz notes coming up next. Welcome back to the Jazz Notes podcast. It is January 9th, recording this on a Tuesday. As always, Ben Anderson and Chandler Holt, we appreciate you listening and sticking with us week to week. All right, let's do uh, quickly, we'll look at the week ahead for the Jazz. We'll talk about one little bit of news for the Jazz uh, and then get into our Jazz grades. Wednesday, 90s night, Greg Ostertag, Brian Russell, Jeff Malone coming back. I heard maybe Carl was going to be here. We'll see. Uh, he's, he doesn't do a lot of interviews anymore, but maybe he uh, makes an appearance at the game. We will obviously know Wednesday night when that happens. Uh, So that's going to be a very tough game, but the Jazz are playing great. Uh, They host Toronto on Friday. Jazz already beat Toronto on the road. You would think that would be winnable, though uh, Toronto did just go into Golden State and absolutely blasted the Warriors. 25-point lead at halftime. Uh, Lakers is going to be a big game because the Jazz might be able to jump them in the standings on Saturday night, and it's on the second night of a back-to-back for the Jazz before facing what should be a Tyrese Halliburton-less uh, Indiana Pacers, he hurt his hamstring last night accidentally doing the splits on the drive to the basket. <laughs> so uh, not not a serious injury, but probably out two weeks, it looks like. Yeah, looking at uh, this four-game um, homestand, 
Denver on 90s night, that's going to be a tough game. Uh, I looked at their injury report. No one big is going to be out missing that one. Uh, like you said, Jazz did beat Toronto uh, last time they played um, up in Scotio Bank Arena. But new look. They have R.J. Barrett and Emmanuel quickly now from the Knicks. So that'll be interesting. I think R.J. had 23 in the first half of the yes. other night. Like he's... He's back home. And he's Canadian, so maybe that's mm-hmm. not a bad fit for him versus you know playing in New York City, which is a whole can of worms. It's very difficult for a lot of guys to do, and wasn't a great fit uh, yeah. next to Jalen Brunson. So, and uh, I think yeah, maybe they're clicking. I think Emmanuel quickly will have an opportunity to sort of maybe not this year, but next year have most improved conversations as well as a starting point guard, a little bit more opportunity because with Tom Thibodeau, he's a defensive coach. Um, there was a lot of times where he just wouldn't play late in games, um, especially in the playoffs last year. Did not get a lot of consistent minutes. Uh, but yeah, Lakers have looked rough. Like I said, 3-7 and seven in their last 10. So normally I would say that'd be a tough game, but maybe um, maybe it won't be. And then Indiana on Monday without Tyrese Halliburton. He is the drive of that offense. So I would say, I feel like we've been shooting low for the Jazz when we look ahead in the weeks. I would say maybe 3-1 and one is possible this week when you look at this. Yeah, I mean, I think you expect to be Toronto and probably Indiana, even though, again, Indiana's pretty good, but if they're missing their best player as well as the Jazz are playing, you should win them. I'm going to go cautious 2-2. Two and 2-2. Two. Two and two. But uh, I would be more surprised by a 1-3 and three than I would a 3-1. and one. Yes. So that's where I would put the Jazz right now. Quick piece of news, uh, Jazz wave Josh Christopher. I think that was a little bit surprising. I'm almost wondering if there's a second ball that's going to drop there, like uh, he's got a draft or he's he's got a, another signing he's either going to Europe or uh, an NBA team's going to call him up to a normal contract but the Jazz waived him after he's been playing pretty well for the Salt Lake City Stars uh and then uh looking at the uh the, the Jazz filled his spot with Jason Preston who uh actually used to be a former NBA blogger it's kind of his funny story yeah. he was a, a Pistons blogger for a little while played at Ohio kind of a do it all triple double threat guard big body not super athletic but kind of just it's kind of a Kelly Olynyk of point guards, which is funny because Kelly Olynyk's the Kelly Olynyk of point guards. He's just kind of a big guy who does things. Uh, he just kind of fills the stat sheet. So yep. I'll be interesting to watch, uh, see how he ends up playing. Okay, really quick. I wanted to uh, take a look at our, I wanted to revisit, sorry, our Jazz Awards. Uh, we filmed a podcast episode one day before the season opener okay. against the Kings, and we gave our uh, NBA awards specifically for Jazz players, MVP, most improved, et cetera. Um, me and you both had Markin in as MVP. Okay. I had Colin Sexton as most improved player, and you had Ochai Agbaji. Rookie okay. of the year, we both went Keontae. That's an easy one. Yep. Defensive player of the year, I had Kessler. You had Chris Dunn. Both of those are looking pretty good. Yep. Um, and then sixth man of the year, I had Sexton again, although he's been starting a lot recently, yep. and you had Kelly Olynyk. Uh, I was wrong on Chris Dunn. Walker Kessler deserves that. Walker's been fabulous. Now, Chris Dunn's a very good defensive player, yep. but Walker is the difference maker right now. In fact, he's taken all these guys who were negative plus minus guys like Keontae George and Jordan Clarkson when they were starting. They were so bad in the starting lineup as far as just their plus minus went. And now they're on the bench. And because they're playing with Walker Kessler, their plus minus has skyrocketed in the last couple of games. So he deserves that credit. Uh, I'll, I'll stick with uh, Kelly Olenek as yep. arguably, you know, Dark Horse Jazz MVP, but really has been the sixth man of the year. I was way off on Ochai. Ochai has not made the leap. Nope. It, is, it has been a rough year for Ochai for sure. Uh, the reason we are revisiting those is because next week, make sure you want to tune in because the Jazz will pass the halfway point of the year. I believe they'll play their 42nd game on Monday. Yeah. Um, so we're going to do some midseason awards, and then, of course, at the end of the year, we'll do it again. But Should we do our Jazz grades? Yeah, let's do Jazz grades. Okay, we like to do this. We uh, look back at the last week. We grade the veterans, the young players, the standings. And the uh, the fun factor of this basketball team. Let's start where we always do with the veterans. I think this is easy again. I think this is an A. Yeah. Well, uh, it's hard to argue. Yeah, definitely an A. Highest grade of the year, I think, so far for the veterans. I think we've only given them like B pluses, maybe an A minus. Uh, but Clarkson puts up 36 against Detroit. Um, Markin in 31. Again, we'll skip over the Boston game. That was rough. But Markin puts up 33 again against Philadelphia. And then just sort of an overall, everyone got uh, their licks in against Milwaukee. Um, I, I agree. I think A for the veterans. Markkinen has truly inserted himself, I think, back into the uh, all-star conversation, which I didn't think there was a chance of. But all of a sudden, if the Jazz are at 500 and in the playoff picture, he has to be in the conversation. Over the last four games, 25 points, 10 rebounds, shooting 50% from the floor, 44% from three. And you look at him on the year, he's like 23, 8, and 2 on 50, 37, 87. Like, unreal numbers he's playing well yeah Colin Sexton continues to cook uh he had what 19 points last night in 18 minutes like he was not on the floor at all because Will Hardy liked what he was getting out of Chris Dunn and Keontae George was was better than usual but uh Colin's been tremendous Jordan Clarkson's really figured it out he didn't have a great box score against Philly but his first three or four minutes of that game in the fourth quarter 
were the reason why the Jazz were able to survive and win that game. And then I actually think he was brilliant last night against Andre Jackson, Milwaukee Bucks. As you mentioned, he was terrific against uh, Detroit as well. John Collins, low key, been kind of good. Yeah. Uh, you know, you never know what you're going to get from John Collins, and he's kind of fading into the background a little bit. But over the last four games, 17 points, six rebounds, shooting 35% from three, 63% from the floor. Had a huge alley oop dunk yesterday in a game when they needed him to score and, and get a bucket. Hit a big shot in the corner very confidently. So uh, you've gotten some very good minutes from the uh, from the vets, and then Kelly is just, he's always good. Yeah, Kelly's shooting 60% from three over the last four <laughs> games. Like, oh, yeah, he's a good player, really good basketball player. So that's uh, a, a for the, the veterans, no question. Uh, next up, the young guys. Uh, like we've said, Walker Kessler has been playing amazing, especially when you look at sort of the advanced stats. Um, Keontae George has been sort of interesting, a little bit slow return ever since his injury. I would say specifically the playmaking has taken a dip, which is something that I have noticed. I think that has to do with playing with Jordan Clarkson in the second unit. Okay. I think in the f- starting role, he felt like he had to get everybody involved, which rightfully so. Yeah. But Chris Dunn is so much better at that because he's been doing it for seven years now in the NBA and Keontae George hasn't that I actually like the idea that you kind of unlocked Keontae as a just like, just be Keontae, which yesterday I tweeted out. I said like summer league Keontae George unlocked. Like That looked more like the summer league guy who was just playing basketball versus the guy in the starting lineup who was trying to get 13, 12, 11 assists like he was as a starter, which I, it's nice that he can do. I never knew if that was going to be what his, his future looked like. If that's what he's going to look yeah. like. But look, he had 19 last night. Actually, there's an argument he was the best player on the floor. I mean, he was really, really good last night. Six, what, assists, four rebounds? Six uh, rebounds, four assists. Yep. Seven of 13. Hit huge threes throughout the game. Keontae was really good. I he think was that really the, good. I think that the best case for Keontae is sort of combining those two. Like you said, when he's in, yeah. the, when he's in the starting spot, he's looking for the double-digit assists, and then now off the bench, he can sort of come in and do what he wants to do. I would say, like, maybe if he can get to, like, an— 18 point mark and then like seven eight assists i feel like that would be perfect for him but yeah young guys i'd say another really high grade simone has been not as good as maybe previous weeks but still solid um let's go for a b plus yeah i think i think that's very solid everybody's contributing everybody is doing their role the way they need to you're not going to see taylor Hendricks, which i thought maybe by january we would but they're playing well enough that you're not going to see him unless the jazz make a trade and we'll address some of that coming up in the uh in the mailbag but yeah, Keontae's cooking. He's playing the role that he probably needs to be playing. He's hitting big shots. He seems happy with what he's doing. Yeah, and Walker is just out of his funk. Yeah. Walker is just, he looks like the guy we saw last year make an all-rookie team. He's really impacting the game in a positive way. And I don't know if he's ever going to be big, dominant, starting power center that, that you see out there in the league. I think. I mean, I think he's a starter long-term. I think that's his role. But he's impacting the game the way you want a big guy to impact the game. He's a great defensive player, and uh, that's a, that's a steal for a guy you kind of got not as a throw in in a in a trade, but was not certainly expected to be one of the focuses of that Rudy Gobert trade going forward. Uh, next up, standings. Like we said, half game from the ten seed, one and a half games from the eight seed. Uh, compared to recent weeks, B B plus here as well. I, I would go A. If, a. if we're going off of what we expected for the week and yeah. what the Jazz got, that was an A. I yeah, agree. you you lost to the best team in the NBA on the road. It was a stinker. But you went three and four and two and one on a road trip that I thought they were going to go winless. So I, I would say A if we want to split the difference. Say A minus. Cool, fine with me. But yeah, the Jazz are climbing up the standings. Eight and two in the last ten. It's as good as anyone in the NBA. Tied with the Boston Celtics and Boston beat the Jazz. But yeah, they're Jazz are cooking. Jazz are really playing well. Next fun factor. I think this is another A. I a. mean, the, yeah, maybe an A plus. Yeah, yeah. The Detroit game, even though it went into OT against a team, maybe you shouldn't be going to OT against. It was a super fun game. Um, and then. Like you said, Philadelphia and Milwaukee are two of the best wins of the season. Yeah, I don't know if Philly was a fun game to watch. Yeah. It was a bit of a, a drudge throughout, and even I follow some Philly riders, and they're like, well, that's two hours that I just can't believe I just spent my life doing. <laughs> but, I mean, the first half last night, again, it's as good a first half as I've ever seen the Jazz play ever, that first half. You know, what, do they have 16 threes at the half or whatever it was, and had just absolutely dominated defense, and everybody was flying around and bought in, and it looked like they were executing what the coach had been asking them, which I had real questions early in the year if they knew what Will Hardy was asking them to do. So, uh, yeah, fun factor, A-plus. They've been really enjoyable to watch. All right, you want to get in the mailbag? Yeah, let's do it. As always, follow us again on Twitter at Ben's Hoops, at Chandler Holt KSL. I send out a uh, a prompt, usually 11.30, 11.45 on Tuesdays, to uh, send in your questions, and we try to address them on the uh, podcast. And if we don't, I also address them in a Q&A that goes out in our uh, newsletter every Tuesday, so make sure you read that. Uh, starting off, two questions from Jazz Time Jones. First up, uh, seems like THT is the odd man out. Is there a market for him? He said that he doesn't mind him, though. He plays hard. There's always a market for 
ten million dollar expiring contracts. There's not a market for Taylor Horton Tucker, the yeah. person, the the player. Yeah, maybe the person. He's a nice guy, not an issue in the locker room. In fact, I think he and Keontae George have become very good friends. Mm-hmm. Like from my interactions and just kind of what I've noticed in the locker room and I've been in there, they're always talking and goofing and they, so you walk in the jazz locker room is a big circle. You walk in the door. So just imagine this far, farthest spot on the other end of the circle is right where Keontae or right where uh, Taylor Horton Tucker is. Keontae George is off to the very far left. I think only Chris Dunn is further left and that's right where the jazz is uh, showers are. So they're kind of far apart from each other. It's a big locker room. They're always yelling at each other. Keontae's the <laughs> loudest person all of a sudden. Other Chris Dunn's loud too. But Keontae's just like, he's totally blossomed and is loud. And so they're buddies and they're always goofing around and talking to each other. But you know what? It makes sense. Keontae George is 20. Taylor Horton Tucker's like 23. Like those guys are really close in age. Jordan Clarkson's in his 30s and has a kid. Uh, Chris Dunn is 26, 27, 28. You know what I mean? Like yeah. those guys aren't actually all that close in age. So THT and Keontae being friends. Makes sense. Uh, market for the contract, not market for the skills. I was about to say, so we'll get into some trade uh, deadline talks here in a little bit with uh, further questions, but do you think because it's the contract and not the player, he would have to be not the main piece in a trade, or maybe it would be him and a pick or something like that? It might just be him for somebody else trying to get off some money that that, that Danny Ainge says, hey, we'll take back a second-round pick and a player that I'm kind of interested in and audition him for another year, and then he's another expiring contract next year, and you just kind of keep this asset alive as far as like, well, next year you have an expiring contract, and the year after that you have an expiring contract. That's actually good kind of front office work because everyone needs front, or everyone needs expiring contracts in big trades, and even if the Jazz don't make one this year, you don't want to lose the ability to make one next year with a $10 million deal, so I could see something as simple as that, where somebody else is just saying like, hey, we're going to be at the luxury tax if we have $10 million on our con- on our books next year, so we're going to get off of that a year early. You know, Evan Fournier, yeah. that type of deal uh, with the Knicks. All right, uh, second one from Jazz Time Jones. Is Simone Fontecchio a long-term piece? I, I bet he's on the Jazz next year. Okay. So with how the NBA works now, that's a long-term piece. You're still on the team next season? You're a long-term piece, in my opinion. He's not Keontae George. He's not, you know, Taylor Hendricks and Lowry Markinen and, you know, Walker Kessler, but... I would say, yes, I think he's a guy that that the Jazz would be very interested in bringing back next year. All right, two questions here uh, that sort of align, so we're going to combine them. First up from Clint Nielsen, who do you think is the second best player on the Jazz? And then uh, Utah Jazz fans, Andy asks, is it possible that Chris Dunn is the second best player on the roster? It's just been such a rotating circle of who's the second best player. Like, I think there's a real argument early in the year, John Collins might have been the Jazz's second best player. He was knocking down threes at a crazy rate and rebounding and getting double-doubles every game. And defensively, he hadn't figured it out. But the Jazz weren't good at all. And John Collins was a part of that not being good, but he might have been in the conversation. And I think there's a real argument that Jordan Clarkson has been, but was not to start the year. Mm -mm. Uh, I think there's a real argument that over the last 13 games now, 14 games he's been starting, Collins Sexton is clearly the Jazz's second best player. Yes. And Kelly Olenek's actually been the Jazz's best plus minus second player. But then you look at the guy who's fixed the Jazz bench we just talked about. Is Walker Kessler has absolutely <laughs> been the like the linchpin of why this Jazz team all of a sudden can play a full 48 minutes, which they could not to start the year. And also, Keontae George has been really good. So I don't know who the Jazz' second best player is. It has not been the same guy all season long. If I were to do, if I were to average it out, it might be Kelly Olynyk. In all honesty, if I were to say at their peak and a sustained run, I'd probably go Colin Sexton. Yeah, um, I think the Jazz are in a very interesting position when you look at their roster compared to other NBA teams. I feel like a lot of NBA teams have a very clear second best player. With the Jazz, I feel like night to night it could be four or five different guys. And you need to have a number one. Yeah, I, I'm a exactly. huge believer you got to have a number one. And look, truly you probably need to have an identifiable number two. Uh, the problem is so many teams have like one, two and three and then they don't have a next best player. They just have a bunch of garbage on their roster. And that's what, you know, it's the Suns problem right now. Uh, I know how good Devin Booker is. I know how good Kevin Durant is. I don't know what to expect from Bradley Beal ever. I never know what to expect from Nurkic. I never and and it's not like oh well because one night this guy's going to be great and the next guy this guy's but it's like who takes a turn ruining the game because they all seem to be doing it. So uh, Jazz are in a good spot in that situation. I don't know who the number two is. Even Will Hardy addressed this last week. He said everyone would have Lowry number one on their list, and I don't know who'd be number two. And I think that's actually okay because it's allowed guys to not have their egos get in the way of Colin Sexton only plays eighteen minutes last night. But the Jazz win, and he was up on the bench and cheering and and getting in people's faces and was very funny. So that's a good thing for right now for the Jazz. All right, stick with me here. We have three questions that are sort of similar, going to combine them. Kenyon John asks, buyers or sellers at the deadline. Parker Evans also asked that, but added if the Jazz should be targeting a specific person. 
And then James McKinney asks, what does Ainge and Zanuck need to do over the next month before the trade deadline? Just win a trade. I, I hate to be boring. Just win. Just win the trade. If you give up a big piece, but you get better pieces back long term, that's fine. If you are buyers, but you win in the buy, that's fine. If you're sellers, but you win in the sell, that's fine. And I, I know that's boring. I know that's not what the Jazz fans want to hear. I, I get that you want like specific names. The Jazz are really versatile right now. If they wanted to fall back in the standings and there's somebody in the draft that they say, oh, man, this kid's going to fall to eight, and we know it. We can position ourselves to be there at eight to get this guy that is going to be a difference maker. I, I would totally understand that and wouldn't have any problem with it. And if they say, we really think we're you know, this position of depth away from making a run, not just to the play-in tournament, but really maybe making the playoffs and getting Lowry Markkinen into the postseason for the first time and Colin Sexton into the postseason for the first time and Keontae George gets to taste the playoffs for the first time in his career and Walker Kessler, and that's really valuable, I, I would totally buy that as well. And Or if you just said, stand pat, convey the pick to Oklahoma City so you have all your freedom going forward, do that, that's fine too. Like, I think if those are all successful outcomes for the Jazz and that really gives them... Basically, a free pass to do whatever they want the rest of the year. What you can't do is make a bad trade where you are saddled with a bad contract going forward that limits your flexibility, or you give up one of your future draft picks for a win-now, like, stupid 40-game rental of a player. I think that's a bad idea. Um, So there are ways to screw it up, and that's if you were to lose a trade, obviously, and get, like, over-anxious. I just do not see Danny Ainge or Justin Zanuck doing that. I don't feel urgency from this team to have to do it plus they're playing well without making a stupid trade to feel like they could still make the playoffs um i think that the buying and selling argument for the jazz is sort of an interesting one because even though this may seem kind of productive i think it's possible for both to be true right i think that they could trade kelly olenic in a sort of a sell trade while also making another trade with tht and whoever else to buy now you know buy up get something better um but I would say a month ago it was more likely to be sell, and I'm not saying it's a win-now trade, but you could definitely buy with a trade uh, at the trade deadline. Yeah, it it would have made no sense really to buy a month ago. Yeah. And now I think you've put that in the conversation of being plausible, and that's a win. Again, you want to give yourself options. You paint yourself into a corner in the NBA. It's what what Phoenix has done, and I know I'm hammering Phoenix, and it's one of my great pastimes in life is (laughs) is hammering the Phoenix Suns, but uh, they have painted themselves in a corner, right? They have to win a title or they're— Morons. Yep. Bradley Beal has four years and two hundred and seven million dollars left on his contract, and is like almost unplayable. Like they're the worst fourth quarter team. You, you only have guys whose whole thing that you're paying them for is to be the best fourth quarter players in close games. That hey, we can take Detroit or sorry, excuse me, Denver to a game seven wherever we are in Denver at altitude or in Phoenix, and in that game, Kevin Durant is going to cook. Yes, because they've had too many games where they've lost by thirty in an elimination game in the playoffs, and they didn't fix the problem. And they've spent all their money and all their future draft assets locked up for the next four or five years only to be able to fix that problem, and they didn't fix the problem. So you have painted yourself in a corner that you cannot get out of anymore. So don't do that. And Danny Ainge right now and Justin Zanuck, they have a 360-degree perspective. You want to win? Go win. You want to buy? Buy. You want to sell? Sell. You want to lose? Lose. And there's all pathways to becoming a better team as a result of it. And that's really hard to do. And obviously, once you get to a certain point of being good, winning a lot of games, you have to go all in. You have to make that gamble to try and win. But the Jazz don't need to rush that because that's what stupid teams do. And and, and this isn't a stupid front office. Yeah, not at all. Uh, One more question up from uh, Leo Jazz Culture. Um, Two part question here. What would the Jazz do at the offseason after conveying the pick and, at worst, making close to the play-in? Uh, again, I don't know if that's at worst. Maybe that is. Maybe if you're going to convey the pick, you might as well make the play-in. I, I get that. Yeah. I totally buy that. Uh, and then, yes, I guess the worst situation would be you lose the pick and then don't get the postseason. Like, you kind of just go into the break. So what do you do at that point? Do you run it back? No, I don't think the Jazz plan is to run it back. I would be surprised if this roster is what the roster is next season. Does that mean huge trade? It's always a possibility, but I think you're always just trying to find little pieces to add and adjust. And, you know, you've got to figure out if you're going to extend Chris Dunn. You've got to figure out if you can extend Simone Fontecchio. I promise you there are players out there that Danny Ainge and Justin Zanuck love and are like, well, that guy's going to be a free agent this year. Or that team needs to shed salary and we're going to be there to, to, to do it and take on those pieces. The Jazz will absolutely make moves this offseason. There's no chance this is a run-it-back offseason for the Utah Jazz, unless they, like, 
win a title. <laughs> you know, they get so hot that they make this crazy run. It's like, oh, nobody saw that coming. Or they, they make the conference finals, which I would never predict. Uh, but barring, yeah, absolutely unforeseen circumstances, this is not a, this is not a run it back. Um, I want to address this as well. Do you think that it is a, a priority for the Jazz to maybe trade some people to move Hendricks and even Bryce Sensabaugh up in the lineup? The obvious answer would be Kelly Olynyk, okay. and you trade Kelly because he's got the best trade market of anyone on the team right now, not named Larry Markkinen, <laughs> uh, because he's expiring and he's $12 million and he's plug and play and all these reasons we've explained in the past. Uh, he makes the most sense to trade, and then you get Kelly, you get uh, Bryce, or excuse me, you get Taylor Hendricks in the rotation. You could still do that. Here's the thing, though: if the Jazz convey their pick, Chandler, they're not going to have a rookie on the roster next year. Probably, they could buy a late or an early second round pick, or trade into the late first round if they wanted to. I don't know if this is the draft you want to do it because you're like you're probably giving up a future first to move into the late first of this draft that's not supposed to be very good, anyways. So just use next year as the on-court rookie seasons for both Taylor Hendricks and Bryce Sensabaugh and let those guys step into the the rotation next year and play the way Keontae George is playing this season, which is sometimes you start, sometimes you're coming off the bench, you're getting 15 to 25 minutes a night. If you're cooking, you're getting 25. If you're playing like a rookie, you're getting 15. And you're not going to have a draft pick next season or, or in 2024, this draft coming up. So just use those guys next year like they're rookies. And who cares? They're 20 years old. They're nine, Jazz drafted three 19-year-olds. Like, Jazz still think of Ochai Abashi as younger. He's five years older than those guys, four years older than those guys. Like, young is such a weird word to use in the NBA because there are young guys like these three 19-year-olds that some of them are now 20. Or there's, you're a first-year player, but you played four years of college. Yep. You know, that's a, just a totally different conversation. So there's no rush, really, to get Taylor Hendricks or Bryce Sensabaugh on the floor. So if you wait till next year to start exposing them to real NBA games, and maybe it's just Taylor, maybe Bryce doesn't make it, maybe he's not an NBA player. Pretty low cost. It was the yeah. 28th pick in the draft. It's not, it doesn't change the outcome of your franchise all that often. Uh, that you can't say that about Taylor Hendricks because he was a number nine overall pick. There's there's some gas there. You 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 need that to pay off. But if next year ends up being his rookie season, fine. Yeah. Whatever. Who cares? You know, you win this year, you develop them next year. Life is good. So I, I could really see that. I could really see that the Jazz don't. I don't think there's any need to make a move this year to put them on the floor. If you want to get them on the floor, I think you can get them on the floor. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to make a trade to do it. And if they don't, you got plenty of time. Uh, we just got one, a funny one from Glenn Anderson. He says, give me three reasons we won't carry this hot streak to the 2024 NBA championship. <laughs> uh, because other teams are going to start trying. Yeah. <laughs> and we're in the dog days of the NBA season where, like, we are 37 days away right now from the All-Star break, which, like, guys are just like, oh, Yeah. Let me just get there. Let me just, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Milwaukee knows. Yes. They know what they do well. They know what they don't do well. They're going to try and make a trade at the deadline to address some of their, their horrendous defense in the backcourt. Uh, you know, Boston is cooking. They're great. We know how good Boston is. They're going to lose some games coming up here that are going to be like, what happened? They're gonna be like, they don't care. They're just trying to stay healthy. This, this middle chunk of the season doesn't matter to them at all. The Lakers right now, 3-7, and seven, don't care. The La- Lakers have LeBron James and Anthony Davis. And over the last 20 games of the season, they're going to flip the switch. They're going to really turn it on. They're going to try and get hot, and they're going to play well. So once teams start trying, it's going to be a different conversation for the Jazz. So, yes, that's why. Unfortunately, this is not a championship Jazz <laughs> roster quite yet. And they've hurt themselves too bad about not being able to, you know, if they were to make the postseason, they won't open a single series at home. Like, the Jazz could make the playoffs. They could go to the play-in tournament and win two games the way this team is right now. If the Jazz had to win two games in the play-in tournament to face the number one seed, they could get there yeah. and, you know, get trounced by Minnesota inevitably, I think. But you could find yourself in that situation. It's, it's certainly more realistic than it was, again, a month ago at this point. But, uh, yeah, all these teams are going to start trying really hard in the second half of the year because they know what they have to do. And they're not trying that hard, and the Jazz are because the Jazz finally got some momentum and they're taking advantage of a somewhat weak schedule, missing some players that they've gone up against that have either gotten hurt or rested games. Uh, and then, you know, Jazz are playing with some momentum in the dog days. It's not saying it doesn't matter. It's been fun to watch. Enjoy it if you're a basketball fan. But there's some some big-time context yeah. there. Thank you guys for tuning into the Jazz Notes podcast. We will be back next Tuesday after the midway point of the season, and we're going to give out our midseason awards. Always uh, find our Jazz newsletter. Again, go and subscribe. 
Uh, if you haven't done it, do it at kslsports.com. You can also click on any Utah Jazz article. You will see the link and the prompt in there. It's really easy to do uh, to get this podcast delivered to you and uh, our Q&A answer sheet that uh, we write up every week a few hours early. So make sure you do that as well. And uh, as Chandler said, you can find us on Twitter at KSL Sports, at Chandler Holt KSL, and Ben's Hoops. And we'll talk to you again next week. 